Hello, everyone. I would like to welcome all of you to the Society of Skeletal Radiology's Resident Education Club webinar. My name is Rehang Amini. I'll be serving as the moderator of this uh, session. It is my pleasure to introduce you to your speaker for this webinar, Dr. Rupert Stanborough. Dr. Stanborough is a radiologist with specialty training in musculoskeletal imaging and intervention. He is an assistant professor of radiology at the College of Medicine and Science, Mayo Clinic. He's a graduate of the University of Tennessee College of Medi Medicine and completed a fellowship at the Mellencrot Institute of Radiology. His clinical interests include, but are not limited to diagnostic musculoskeletal radiology, diagnosing bone and soft tissue tumors or percutaneous biopsies, using image guidance such as CT, ultrasound and fluoroscopy, and treatment of bone and soft tissue tumors with percutaneous ablation and cementoplasty. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Stanborough. Hello, thank you for the introduction. My name is Rupert. Um, tonight we're going to be looking at some Tuma cases. And it's a reminder with Arnold playing peekaboo here that if you're not pronouncing it like Arnold, you're doing it wrong. Okay. So tonight we only have six cases. Uh, all cases will come with some type of companion with it. Uh, I don't get to see your faces. I don't get to see the tears from the torture, but um, do your best taking these at home. Um, I'll try and allot an appropriate amount of time to look at these cases. And then I'm going to prompt you as we go, maybe with some multiple choice questions or maybe just with some discussion. Okay. So let's look at our first case here. Pelvis radiograph, 40-year-old male with a pain in his butt, which I hope this is not a pain in your butt tonight. So more specifically, he's got a pain in his left butt, correct? So we've got this mass here projecting over that left upper buttock. It's hard to say with just this one view if it's associated with bone or just soft tissue. There seems to be some type of component coming off of the bone, right? I want you to pay particular attention to this type of matrix that you're seeing associated with this tumor here. So what's our next step? Is it A, MRI, B, a technetium 99 bone scan, C, just go ahead and biopsy it, or D, reassure the patient that it's nothing to worry about and to enjoy a nice life? All right, so MRI is the next step. And here is the coronal T2 stir of the pelvis, and you'll see corresponding with that mass in that left upper buttock, we have a pretty obvious finding here. So once you look at this image, I want you to think about the signal intensity and see if that narrows down any of your differential. Think back to those radiographs and some of that matrix you saw in the radiographs and how that might help you. And same MRI, I've got two uh, images here of the upper pelvis. This upper left image is our axial T1, and this is our axial T2 fat set. And I specifically chose this slice here. It's at the upper aspect of the mass. And I want you to think, why did I pick this slice? What added value is this giving us to help make the diagnosis in this case? All right, and again, I'm now showing you those radiographs next to this MRI image, and you'll see that those areas of mineralization compared with the MRI image, we've now got these uh, areas of, of signal void, right, which is what we would expect. Again, the mass is maybe a little bit bigger than we we're expecting just off of the radiograph. Seems like there's a lot more extension there. And now I want you to make the diagnosis, okay? Piece that all together. Is it A, a primary chondrosarcoma? A B, a secondary chondrosarcoma, C, osteosarcoma, or D, a chordoma. All 
All right, so let's go back and look at these images. So on the radiographs, this is what I would describe as rings and arcs calcifications, right? That's the path mnemonic term that we have for something that makes chondroid matrix, okay? So something like a cartilage tumor, okay? The uh, MRI image, right? You can see that apart from those calcifications, it's very T2 hyperintense. Remember these axial images I picked at a specific level? Well, I want you to notice this little bone finding associated with this upper portion of the mass here. And if you describe this bone finding correctly, this is an exostosis from that posterior cortex or posterior iliac bone here. And it's continuous with cortex and with the marrow, which is how we would describe a benign lesion called an osteochondroma, okay? And osteochondromas have little thin cartilage caps on them usually. Those cartilage caps are usually less than two centimeter. And unfortunately, occasionally these things will undergo malignant transformation. The cartilage cap will and turn into a chondrosarcoma, okay? So the correct response I was looking for in this case is secondary chondrosarcoma, okay? And it's secondary because it's associated with the osteochondroma. Again, here's the CT image, and it nicely shows that little pedunculated osteochondroma. Okay. Normally, it should have a very thin cartilage cap, but this one's cartilage cap has now turned into that chondrosarcoma, this big mass. Okay. And I'm going to leave a lot of these cases just with one or two very quick statements. I, I don't think it's fair to ask you uh, to remember a million facts about all these tumors. I think this is just a nice little summary for you that uh, maybe you don't know some of this yet. Maybe it'll just give you something to take home. And on, for this case, I want you to know about osteochondromas. They're continuous with marrow and cortex and should have that thin cartilage cap, which usually we imply less than two centimeter. In practice, I found that that cutoff is not that, that particular. Usually it's something like this case where that cartilage cap is now a monster or it's a very thin cartilage cap. Right. And this patient, they uh, resected that part of the iliac bone that had the osteochondroma, and then did an on block resection of the soft tissue component there. And now here's some companion cases for you. Right. So I want you to look up at that left iliac bone again, same location where we had that the case abnormality. And you'll see again, we have this bone finding right here. Projects over the bone, probably has some kind of component coming into the soft tissues, but maybe it originates from bone. We don't know. We're going to have to get some cross-sectional imaging. Here's our MRI images on the left in axial T1 and on the right in axial T2 fat sat. And this one you would describe the same way as an osteochondroma because it is an osteochondroma. We're continuous with the marrow space and we're continuous with the cortex. When you look at the cartilage cap on T2 weighted imaging, you'll see it's very thin, less than two centimeters. This is a benign osteochondroma. The difference between this osteochondroma and the osteochondroma of the case where we had that uh, transformation to a secondary chondrosarc, this one's sessile. So the base of this is wider and attaches to the bone, whereas the pedunculated cases almost look like a mushroom. And then I think some of you guessed it, but this case had a daily double. That's not Alex Trebek if you didn't know. And what is that? It's Paget's disease. So this, if, if you ever see a, a, a tumor board case in your residency, you can almost guarantee that you're going to see a case of Paget's disease. And I felt lucky that I had a case where I had that finding on there. So Paget's disease, right? We've got that stereotypical cortical thickening, marrow expansion, trabecular coarsening. This is slam dunk Paget's instantal finding for this patient. So second companion case, we're on the theme of exostotic bone lesions. And this one may be a little bit more tricky to see the abnormality. So 
So if you need to ask for help, there's no one better than Kylian Mbappe is going to give us a hand. And Kylian is looking right at that lesion that I want you to look at. Okay, so again, something looks like bone, sort of half hanging off the bone, half over it. One view of radiograph, not very helpful. There's also another finding on here. If you look below this bone finding, there seems to be an outline of a more fat density component to this. So what did we do? MRI, and this is the corresponding MRI finding. So here's that bone finding, right, coming off of the periosteum. And then overlapping this bone finding, we have this big blob of fat that otherwise we would say is just a lipoma, right? This is T1, this is T2 fat set, it completely sats out. There's nothing suspicious in this fat, okay? It just happens to be associated with this little bone finding here. Here's the CT image. Again, you have this little piece of exostatic bone formation here, and then this nice lipomatous mass on top. What's the difference between the last two cases and this case when we talk about this little bone finding here? Well, remember with an osteochondroma, I said that it's going to be continuous with the cortex and the marrow cavity, okay? And this one, we have that cortical bone cutting off that marrow cavity. So this is not an osteochondroma, okay? This is actually a little bit of tethering of that periosteum, okay? And the diagnosis of this case is a par osteolipoma, okay? People say it looks like a tree, okay? That little piece of bone that comes off the periosteum it's almost tethering that, that periosteum there and it makes the trunk. And then the, the fatty mass on top almost looks like the leaves. And I put some apples on here. You won't believe how long this cartoon took me to make. And you won't believe how long it took me to add that owl to the tree as well. But this is what these parosteolipomas look like, okay? And they are benign findings. So case one's over. Let's move on to case two. And this is the same leg in the same patient. I'm giving you an AP view and a lateral view of their tibia and fibula. And again, I'm gonna give you a few seconds to think about it. This is a really nice case. This is an aunt mini case, okay. So there's our finding. I imagine you all describe it as cortical thickening with a central nidus. Here's the CT, which doesn't add much because we already knew this, but there's some cortical thickening and a central nidus here. Right? This is a calcification inside that nidus. And I expect you know what it is at this point, so I'm going to skip that question and ask you, what's the history that you would expect with this lesion? Okay, Is it A, recent motor vehicle collision, B, family history of multiple cancers, C, nighttime pain relieved with NSAIDs, or D, I just saved a bunch of money switching my car insurance? And I'm a mean guy, I'm not gonna give you immediate feedback. I'm gonna ask you a second question. What is a true statement about this lesion? A, autosomal dominant inheritance. B, thermal ablation is a good treatment option. C, there's a high mortality rate. Or D, it's usually responsive to antibiotics. So the answer to question one, this is an osteoid osteoma, and osteoid osteomas are benign lesions that are incredibly painful. And usually the patient will have this very classic history, okay, nighttime pain, they'll say it wakes them up at night, and it's the pain's relieved with taking NSAIDs, ibuprofen, Tylenol, things like that, okay? 
And the true statement on this question is that thermal ablation is a good treatment option. And that's certainly uh, what I did in this case. So I did a cryoablation here. That's Mr. Freeze. Arnold's making his second appearance on tonight's talk. Uh, Mr. Freeze stuck the cryoprobe through the nidus of this tibial bone lesion. These cryoprobes make predictable ice ball sizes, and then we froze it. And uh, the patient uh, had zero pain in about a week's time. There's multiple ways you can treat these with thermal ablation, right? Radio frequency ablation, where you heat it up, uh, is more classically uh, the treatment known, but certainly people do microwave ablation, cryoablation, you name it. And in this case, I just happened to do the cryoablation. And here's that one statement I want to know about this case, right? Osteoid osteomas are painful, benign lesions, often with this classic history. And the nidus is this lucent area. This is a calcification in the nidus. So when you do your treatment, you really want to cover that nidus completely there. So here's our companion case. It's a FEMA radiograph, AP, and then I've magged up the area of interest in the center of the screen. So in this case, I feel like you would describe it in a very similar way to the osteoidosteoma, right? We've got an area of cortical thickening, and we've got this central lucent area that kind of looks like the nidus from the osteoidosteoma case. There's some additional clues on this femur radiograph. If you look at this more distal femur, we've got some patchy sclerotic areas, particularly in this subchondral femoral condyles here. And if you've really got your noggin on tonight, maybe you can piece it all together already of what this patient has and you know how they're associated with each other. So here's the MRI. So this is our axial T2 fat set, and then we've got coronal images at the same slice position, coronal T2. Uh, stir, and this is our coronal T1. And let's start with this image, right? So this is at the level of that nidus looking lucent thing in that cortical thickening, right? Thickened cortex, there's a defect coming from that medullary space outside the bone into the soft tissues. The soft tissues at that location are inflamed, right? They're really annoyed about what's going on nearby, okay? And then we look at the rest of the femur, We've got these patchy serpiginous areas in the marrow space of the diaphyseal region. And then we've got these maybe more island-shaped uh, defined areas in that subchondral bone. So this is osteonecrosis, okay? And this is a site of osteomyelitis, okay? So this patient has sickle cell disease, which accounts for a lot of these uh, areas of osteonecrosis. And they're also at that increased risk of getting osteomyelitis, which unfortunately uh, this patient has. And that finding that looked like that loosened area in the thickened cortical bone is actually the cloaca, okay? And it's this little channel coming from that medullary space outside cortical bone there. Case two over. Hope you're, no one's logged out yet. And we're gonna move on to case number three. Right. So this is a really impressive case, okay? So obvious abnormality here. This is a axial T1 image. We're at the level of the upper chest. Okay? The scapula is in here somewhere. And then this is the corresponding axial T2 fat set image at the same level, okay? Now I'm going to give you a little bit of history and see if that helps you figure out what is going on here. So notice it's a younger patient. 
slowly growing mass. And it's very easy to see this T2 hyperintense component of this tumor. But Willy Wonka, the OG Willy Wonka, has given us a little clue. There's another finding on here that you may have overlooked. This little finding right here. And if you look at it on T1 and T2 facet, it's hypointense or dark on both. So how does that help us here? This is the coronal image, show you just how extensive this mass is. Again, there's a T2 hyperintense component, but there's also these darker hyperintense components in this mass as well. So what do you think the diagnosis is? Is it a liposarcoma, a desmoid-type fibromatosis, or some people just say desmoid tumors, a lyomyosarcoma, or a pleomorphic undifferentiated sarcoma? And I want to remind you of the patient's age, 20 years old. And I made a big fuss about some of that signal change in parts of the mass. Okay, so this is desmoid type fibromatosis. Okay. Unfortunately, it usually affects younger adults, particularly younger females. And here's my second follow-up question. What's true of desmoid-type fibromatosis? Is it benign and locally aggressive? Are there many effective treatment options? And does surgery have a low recurrence rate? The correct answer here is benign and locally aggressive, right? These are not malignant lesions. And unfortunately, there aren't many effective treatment options. There's many attempted treatment options, but I would say that there's really no gold standard at this time for this is the way we treat these. Certainly, I wouldn't say that surgery is a low recurrence rate. Unfortunately, a lot of these uh, that we see, they've had surgery to try and remove or debulk these, and they come back with a vengeance. And a lot of times they are large and invasive and have these aggressive features like this. And when, uh, when this happens, it can become quite a morbid case for us to do something like a thermal ablation. We certainly can do cryoablation on a lot of these desmoid type fibromatosis lesions. Um, you can imagine in this case with our brachial plexus nearby, right? This would be could be quite a morbid case, and it'd be hard to get complete margins around this thing. You'd also be taking out a lot of muscle tissue here. Okay, this uh, this finding here is more of that fibrous tissue. So when we monitor these lesions, um, whether they're undergoing treatment or not, because sometimes without treatment they they actually become more quiescent. These more fibrous regions seem to be more of the quiescent areas that don't grow, whereas perhaps these T2 hyperintense areas that also usually are the parts that enhance seem to be the areas that seem to grow more. Um, a lot of uh, a lot of times I like to think of these like a keloid scar, you know, a keloid scar where you have that hypergranulation tissue. The treatment really shouldn't be removing, cutting them open and removing that scar because you create more opportunity for that uh, hyper hypergranulation tissue to form. So really no good treatment options. Usually they are very impressive when, you, uh, when we see them and very unfortunate cases. But what I want you to remember about this, right? Desmoid type fibromatosis, it's benign, it's locally aggressive and there's a high recurrence rate. Okay. Here's companion case. I purposely picked you know, a similar location that upper chest wall, and we've got the same two MR sequences here. We've got that axial T1, and we've got our axial T2 uh, stir in this case. And this one also looks awful, right? It's massive. It's It looks invasive. So wrap your head around this one for a bit. 
Now I want to point out on this on this fluid sensitive image, right? It looks like it involves the pleura. There's ribs in here somewhere, and they're either involved by this, or maybe they've just been remodeled over a long, long amount of time. It involves muscle, right? Comes back here to muscle, it involves fat. It goes into the breast and it goes to the skin surface. There's also these little hyper intense findings in these more dilated areas of these structures that on the CT correspond with little calcifications. And those are going to be called flebaliths because this is a venous malformation. Okay, This venous malformation was treated uh, by our IR, IR colleagues. Here's the post IR imaging here. The thing I want you to know about these venous malformations is they can be uh, transpatial. So what do I mean by that? So look how it's entered the pleural space. There's some involvement of the bone. It goes in the muscles. It goes in the fat. It goes in the breast. It goes to the skin surface. And that's a finding that you frequently encounter with venous malformations. Uh, I did not see any evidence of a high flow component on the MR imaging, and this truly was a venous malformation. Okay. Be aware there are some terminology issues um, that your IR colleagues will beat you on the head if you use the wrong term sometimes, but this one was truly a venous malformation. Okay, halfway done. And moving right along, we've got a 60-year-old man with a palpable mass. And this palpable mass was in their medial right thigh. Now, I don't want to torture you or waste too much time on this image because I really don't see anything on this radiograph. So if you made up something, you might have been hallucinating, good for you, but I don't see anything on this radiograph, okay? I'm showing you this because in practice, we always like to have radiographs when we read our MRIs looking at soft tissue and bone tumors, but a lot of times soft tissue, it doesn't do anything, right? Think back to the other case where we had the chondroid matrix. There's nothing in whatever this tumor is going to be that we're seeing radiographically. So let's skip right to the MRI. And I've got the same slice coronal of that thigh. We've got our fluid sensitive T2 stir, a T1. And then this is going to be our post contrast image. What can what can we what can we learn from these images, right? So each each sequence has something something new for us. So it's T2 hyper intense, and it's not just a little bit bright, right? It's light bulb bright. Okay. And when you see it that bright, right, I can see some little septations in here. So I don't think that it's a cyst. But the post contrast image confirms to me that it's not a cyst, also, right? We have this little internal enhancement to it here, very mild, but we're confirming it's not a cyst on this, okay? The T1 image, it looks like it's intramuscular, right? It's deforming this muscle over it here, but it also comes with this little fat cap on it, which is uh, a frequent associated finding with this type of lesion. And then you'll oftentimes get a little bit of leakage of whatever this material is into the adjacent muscle, and you have these kind of wispy, wispy tails above and below it sometimes. So here's my prompt for you. Which of the following tumors is never T2 hyperintense? Is it a benign peripheral nerve sheath tumor, an intramuscular myxoma, a myxoid liposarcoma, synovial sarcoma, pleomorphic undifferentiated sarcoma? Boy, we've got a lot of sarcomas on here. Lyomyosarcoma or a chondromyxoid sarcoma? Right. What is never T2 hyperintense? 
So this is a gotcha moment. So all of these can have T2 hyperintense components. So how does the T2 hyperintensity help us in this case? Well, it's light bulb bright T2 hyperintensity, right? What's our next step with this lesion? Do we reassure the patient? Don't worry about it. It's probably nothing. Do we surveil it? Tell the patient, don't worry about it. It's probably nothing, but I don't want you to sue me. So we're going to keep MRIing you every six months. Do we just go ahead and biopsy it now? Do we do a bone scan? I don't know why you do a bone scan for the soft tissue finding, but that's interesting. Or do we do an Indian 111 tagged white blood cell scan? Somebody said biopsy will be painful, but do it. It won't be painful for you. And the correct answer is biopsy. We usually want to biopsy this, okay? And this is something called an intramuscular myxoma, okay? They're often extremely T2 bright, and sometimes we mistake them for cysts. So a lot of times we like to have that post-contrast imaging to prove that it's not a cyst, okay? That triangular fat cap sign is pathognomonic also for these intramuscular myxomas. So why do we biopsy them, okay? We biopsy them because a lot of bad neoplasms, think all these myxoid liposarcomas, things like that, um, they can have such a big myxoid component that we could be wrong, okay? And uh, to this day, uh, the, the best way to prove that this is just a myxoma, nothing else is to do the biopsy. And we found particularly here that when we do these biopsies, we really like to use a bigger gauge needle. And we uh, always try and do these with a 14 gauge needle here. And I don't know if it's here or if it's everywhere, but there seems to be something when you place it in the media, you know, the formalin or something where the, the tissue, the snotty mixed wood material maybe gets, uh, you know, washed away or evaporated a bit. It's hard to say, but the pathologists really want a lot of good tissue when we do these myxomatous biopsies. Okay. So intramuscular myxoma is T2 hyperintense, usually intramuscular. They don't have to be. And we often biopsy them to exclude other neoplasms. So here's our companion case. Right. We have an axial T1, axial T2 fat set, and a post contrast image through the thigh. And this one, you'll also notice that it is very T2 hyperintense, right? It's a very T2 hyperintense mass sitting right here. Okay? Again, the post-contrast imaging, not a cyst, sort of has this central enhancement there, almost like a target. And then around this, it doesn't look intramuscular. We've got this nice fat plane between these posterior compartment muscles. Okay. So maybe you've got a nice differential at this point, but I'm going to show you the key image, right? Here's our sagittal, right? This is the femur. This is anterior thigh. This is posterior thigh. And there's our lesion. And we have this nice spaghetti string structure coming into the top of that and into the bottom of this lesion here, okay? And what kind of looks like spaghetti that lives in the back of our thigh right? or sciatic nerve? Okay? So this was a sciatic nerve benign peripheral nerve sheath tumor. There was nothing suspicious about this nerve sheath tumor, okay? And then my second companion, I just showed you a benign peripheral nerve sheath tumor, right? We have a upper pelvis MRI, we have T1, and we have a T2 fat sac. And there's several abnormalities on these images, but I want to draw your attention to this finding here in the left iliac fossa, right? We have this large T2 hyperintense mass. It's gonna be more than five centimeters for sure, right? The margin is a little bit hard to follow. Is this some inflammation around it? Is it invasive? Hard to say on this one image I've given you, okay? Like I said, it's very T2 hyperintense. When we look at our corresponding T1 images, this little area of bright T1 signal, of hyperintense T1 signal. And now I want you to think about, well, what would be bright on a T1 weighted image? Okay. 
So the things I know about fat, right? We have bright fat on here, but when I look at my fat saturated image, there's nothing that sets out to say that that's fat. Okay. Could it be gadolinium contrast? Well, this is not a post contrast gadolinium image, so it's not gadolinium. Okay. Some people say melanomas, maybe melanin, maybe pertinaceous material can be a little bit T1 hyper intense, right? This is pretty T1 hyper intense. But the other finding that this actually is is hemorrhage. And in that subacute phases of hemorrhage, you can get some T1 hyper intensity. Okay. So this is maybe, this is a large mass, maybe some invasive margins, T1 hyper intense, there's probably some hemorrhage in it. Okay. And then let's look elsewhere on this image. We have more T2 hyperintense masses. Right? This is where your lumbosacral trunk lives. This is where your femoral nerve lives. Let's look at the skin surfaces. All these little weird skin findings that are T2 hyperintense popping up. Okay. I think you're starting to piece it together, right? Here's the coronal images. We've got all these plexiform masses coming out from the spine, right? Multiple masses here. Here's that one in question. So this patient has NF1, neurofibro neurofibromatosis type 1. And they're at an increased risk for malignant peripheral nerve sheath tumors. And usually on imaging, these are going to be uh, large, usually more than five centimeters, invasive, which I think we have here, and uh, sometimes hemorrhage within the mass. Okay. So this was biopsied and it was proven to be a malignant peripheral nerve sheath tumor. Enough, enough, enough. Maybe you're saying enough GIFs, just move on. I, I can't make PowerPoints without GIFs and memes. It just provides me too much happiness. So moving along, we've got two more cases, I think. This is a younger patient, 12-year-old female with atraumatic left knee pain. Yes, yeah, something is wrong in this left tibia. We don't need Kylian Mbappe's help to see this one. You almost wonder if I've thrown in another case of an osteochondroma here, but I want you to focus on this finding right here. Okay. Here is the lateral radiograph. And then I've magged up that proximal TB here for you to look at. And I want you to tell me what's going on with this periosteal change. Is it aggressive or non-aggressive? This is aggressive. So this is a destructive lesion in this tibia. When you get to the lateral view, you really see how much of that posterior cortex is gone, is destroyed. Okay, We have this aggressive periosteal change, and this little component here is a nice little name. That's Codman's triangle, right? And these are all findings of aggressive periosteal change, destructive lesion. I'm scared at this point when I see this on a radiograph. Okay? You almost wonder, could this just be some bone of the cortex that's kind of been blown posteriorly, or is it some matrix being formed by this tumor? Here's the MRI. This is our axial T2 fat set, and this is our post-contrast axial at the same slice. And I think it's impressive how much bigger this tumor is on the MRI than we were expecting on the radiographs. So start piecing it together, right? So we've got something destroying bone with a soft tissue component. There is aggressive periosteal change happening. Is there some bone pushed posterior? Or is there some kind of matrix being formed within this? This post-contrast image implies that there's some central necrosis. Usually, uh, fast-growing aggressive tumors sort of outgrow their blood supply. Um, so maybe that's why they have some necrosis there. So my question for you, what's the best next step? And this is a layup. This is an easy question, right? 
this little plug that I, I want to bring up. So do we biopsy it or do we biopsy it after discussion with ortho-oncology? Well, certainly wouldn't hurt to discuss with ortho-oncology if you're going to biopsy it. I just want to remind everyone when you have these scary tumors like this that you think are primary bone sarcomas, um, where the patient's uh, going to be evaluated for a limb sparing surgery, uh, you want to approach these lesions during your biopsy in a very particular manner. You don't want to uh, risk seeding and soiling uh, compartments that the surgeon is not planning to cut through to get to this thing. Uh, you want to keep the patient's chances of having no recurrence low, and you want to keep the patient's chances of being eligible for these limb sparing surgeries possible, okay? In the ideal world, you would send these cases to a tertiary care center that deals with these things, uh, or speak to your ortho-oncologist to tell you how they would like you to biopsy these lesions. Uh, in the real world, let's be honest, sometimes you're going to be put in positions where you're biopsying things and you maybe don't even think that it's a sarcoma at this point. But there are guidelines that have been published that give us some good advice of the best ways to get into a lot of these extremity tumors. They exist for upper and lower extremities. You can find it like you can with this radiographic article here. So this was biopsied. It was an osteosarcoma. And you can see this patient had a limb sparing surgery. You can see they did a partial resection of the tibia, placed some bone graft in here, and then all this metal is to keep everything still while that bone graft heals, okay? What's the one thing I want you to take home, right? Osteosarcomas, three things. Usually cortex destruction, usually a soft tissue mass component, and usually osteoid matrix, which I think we had all three in that case. And then I'm going to draw your attention to this companion case here. And I'm definitely no neuroradiologist, but I know enough to see that there's something going wrong on this patient's face, okay? This maxillary sinus is completely filled up with something. We're missing hard palate bone here. We're missing maxilla. We're missing uh, sinus wall. We're missing orbit. It's going into the nasal cavity, right? So we've got bone destruction. Okay? I've got a soft tissue mass component. This is post-contrast, maybe some necrosis in there. And then these areas, you wonder, is that osteoid matrix again, okay? And this also was an osteosarcoma, which, boy, I don't think the top five differentials I would put if I was reading this de novo would be osteosarcoma, but bones, but wherever bone is, you could have osteosarcoma, and it happened to be this in this case. So just be one next time you have the sniffles or you have that little sinus pain, you might want to get it checked out. All right. So if you uh, aren't fed up yet, here's Kylo Ren asking for one more case. For all the Star Wars nerds out there, or is it Star Trek? I can't remember. I'm just teasing. I know it's Star Wars. Okay. 60 year old with butt pain. There's a lot of butt pain going on. All right. We've got our lateral sacrum radiograph. And I'm going to mag up on the abnormality for you. And if you don't see much, at least you can tell that there's something missing, right? And that's a lot of bone is missing at that sacral coxal junction. What are we going to do next? Well, if you have them, you got to use them. So let's get an MRI of it. You can see that corresponding finding. So on that left side of the screen here, right, that's our sagittal T1 through the sacrum. And this is going to be our T2 stir. What do we see? We have T2 hyperintense. See how many tumors we said of T2 hyperintense tonight? It's really not that helpful. And then we see that it's extending outside of bone, right? It corresponds with that bone destruction there. Right? No, this is not another osteosarcoma case. That'd be pretty cool of me. Okay. And it's that lower sacrum, upper coccyx. 
And here's the oblique axial images. And you can see how big that this tumor is. It's definitely expanded outside of bone. T2 bright. You don't think it's a cyst, right? You can see these little differing T2 hyperintensity, these little septations in it. Post contrast, you can see it sort of has these little lumpy, bumpy peripheral nodular enhancement. What else do you notice? Where is it located? It seems to be bang in the middle of my images here. That's interesting. So what's our diagnosis? Benign notochordal tumor, so we'll say remnants. Uh, B, a chordoma. C, a chondrosarcoma. I showed you one of them already, the secondary type. Or D, a giant cell tumor of sacrum, which supposedly is the second most common sacral tumors. And it's a chordoma. So the key to this one, we have a uh, T2 hypersense lesion, which again could be certainly these three, right? It would be T2 bright. Uh, but this one uh, expanded outside of bone and destroyed bone, right? A benign notochordal tumor shouldn't do that, okay? A chondrosarcoma could. But the chordomas particularly like to be midline, and that tumor was midline, and it loves to be on that spine axis. So you can see these in the clivus, you know, near the skull base, and you can see them all the way down to the sacrum and coccyx. And since I'm an MSK radiologist, I probably see all the ones in the sacrum and coccyx, and our neuroradiology colleagues probably see all the ones in the clivus and think they're way more common. But we'll see these uh, not infrequently in these things. And the key is midline, okay? Chondrosarcomas. Uh, usually eccentric, just like giant cell tumors are usually eccentric from midline. Okay, so what I want you to remember about this case T2 hyperintense midline sacral mass with extraction screen. Okay, that's a chordoma. Here's our last case we're going to look at it's the companion to this case. And there's a really hard finding here. I'll take a look at that right. S1, Ooh, and someone called it already, and I'm very impressed. It's very hard to see prospectively. Uh, there's an abnormality with the right S1 nerve frame, and it's expanded. And then when I show you the MRI, you'll say, how, how was this so hard to see? So here's the corresponding MRI. So level of our sacrum, right? Oblique axial, these are both fluid sensitive. I've got this pretty large mass here that's coming outside of bone posteriorly. It actually deformed the skin back here. That's how the patient knew about it, the younger patient. Uh, it extended through that neuroframen. You can see the normal left neuroframen here with the exiting nerve. And on this side, you can see that nerve is displaced anteriorly. This patient had radiculopathy down that right leg. And this mass is really irritating that bone around it. You can see this marrow demon, the bone where this mass contacts. And then the really cute thing that I love, love, love about this case is look at all these fluid, fluid levels, right? This is the sagittal image. We're eccentric, right? We're off midline, but this is part of the sacrum. And this is that mass coming posteriorly there. Here's the butt, okay? They're laying on their back. So we've got all these fluid, fluid levels from, the, from gravity, right? From different density fluids, okay? This isn't just one cyst, right? This is multiple, multiple, multiple cysts. This is the appearance that you would have for an aneurysmal bone cyst, okay? Certainly, aneurysmal bone cyst is in my differential for this finding, okay? This was not an aneurysmal bone cyst. Multiple tumors can have ABC features, okay? So I want you to tell me which of these tumors can have ABC features. Is it a giant cell tumor? Telangiectatic osteosarcoma, one of our osteosarcoma variants. An osteoblastoma, right, which is a cousin of our osteoid osteoma. Usually these are posterior elements of the spine. Usually they're more than two centimeter minus, okay. Or a chondroblastoma, okay. 
And Michael Scott telling you this is your second gotcha case. All of these can have ABC features associated with them, okay? So it doesn't really help us, the ABC feature. So we had to biopsy it. And this one happened to be an osteoblastoma. Very cool case. Again, my top differential for this one just off of uh, frequency was ABC, giant cell tumor, osteoblastoma. Uh, it was further down my list. All right. I really appreciate everyone's attention. Thank you for tuning in. We'll now take some questions and uh, I'll take a lot of praise, but please no criticism. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Sanborough, for the wonderful presentation. And um, also for pointing out the strong link between sniffles and osteosarcoma. I think that's an overlooked, um, you know, an overlooked connection. Um, the joke, of course. Well, our audience is typing in their questions in the QA box. Uh, I want to remind everyone to look for the survey link in the chat and in your um, in your email. I don't see any questions in the Q&A at this moment. Um, let's see, nothing in the chat box either. Um, I, I did have one question. Um, this comes up a lot uh, for us. Uh, what are your thoughts on the cartilage cap? You know, there's different cutoffs, 1.52 centimeters versus uh, some people saying that the cutoffs are pretty useless. You know, there's the board's answer and then the real life answer. How do you handle the cartilage cap measurements? Oh, you're muted. Uh, muted. You. Sorry about that. I think you've you've touched on the issue, right? So I remember going through boards and you panicked. Is do they want me to say 1.5 centimeters? Oh, which one do I want to say? Um, I actually looked up on StatDX. I thought that might be a good source just to see maybe what what they say. And they said two centimeters. That's the one I put in. I certainly, you know, if someone argued and said it's 1.5 semen, okay, I know that's out there. But the, you know, the ones I've seen, it's not that hard to discriminate. It's usually that bomb's gone off and there's this huge chondroid tumor now associated with it, or it's just a very thin cap. Is that yeah. the experience that you've had? Yeah, usually it's not that that difficult. So yeah, um, we don't usually measure them. Uh, it's just, yeah, it, I think some people like the measurements just because it gives them a little bit more confidence in, in their call. Yeah. Um, we do have a question in the chat box. Um, do you recommend any follow-up for benign notochordal rests? And maybe for some of the audience um, who don't know what those are, uh, if you could. Yeah, so um, those, a lot, a lot of times you'll see them, right? They're, these, they're usually little T2 hyperintense lesions. They're also usually midline uh, in the sacrum, kind of down that axis there. Um, they're usually incidental findings, I feel like. They shouldn't be asymptomatic. Um, there's some theories on them. One of them is that you're born with these, right? And it's just kind of a, an arrested uh, piece of tissue there that got stuck in the bone. Um, I don't think, like, I don't think that there's a, um, a right or wrong way to manage these. We, I've certainly, when I first came out, I felt like I recommended follow-ups of these. Um, now, a lot of times I'll just, I feel a little bit more confident. I'll say, I think this is just a, you know, benign notochordal rest or remnant and sort of leave it up to, you know, the patient to start having symptoms. Cause if it starts, if it, if let's say you're missing a baby chordoma or something right. like that kind of bone yet, I think is the biggest fear. Um, I think it's going to make itself pretty obvious, um, eventually. So right. and I just think, is it, you know, if you followed all these notochordal rests, it's uh, it's a lot of imaging, a lot of follow -up. what what do you think? Yeah, yeah, it's um yeah, it's it's complicated as well because we have seen baby chordomas, and because they're so slow slowly growing, you know, they just sit there and then you go back for you know you you go back to like an MRI ten years ago when they had back pain, and you can maybe see a little T two bright spot there. Yeah. um and it's that that kind of scares the uh, the crap out of you. and but I, we can't follow every single one of these. There's some patients just have so many of them. And yeah. um, I don't know if anyone's ever proven, and if anyone's in, in the audience has any ideas, any proven a link between them turning into chordomas, you know, proven notochordal, benign notochordal cell tumors and, um, and chordomas. But yeah, I agree they're challenging. And then, you know, I think I've recommended, let's say six month follow-up sometimes. And then you get a six month follow-up and it's not changed well. Yeah, yeah. Yes. <laughs> Other six months? Do you go to a year now? You know, yeah, I, yeah. You know, so if someone smarter than me could figure it out and tell me what to do, I'd appreciate it. Yeah. Thank you. Um, and then there's some questions in the QA. If um sorry, I, I 
cat is blocking it. Um, is the first sickle cell anemia osteomyelitis patient? Uh, when do you call Brody's abscess? When do you call Brody's abscess? Well, yeah, I mean, like, in go. that patient. Oh yeah, um, the loosened area in that in that region was more of the cloaca. Um, it looked like, but you know, if I had sort of that, if that lytic area, you know, was a nice pus filled cavity, I'd probably say Brody's abscess. So the fact that it had broken through the bone and had that classic cloaca um, appearance, I would have just called it a cloaca at that point. But I know that uh, I know that patient, uh, you know, was taken to the OR and, and debrided, but um, has since come back with multiple similar site infections. So, hmm. All right. um, another question: Is it sufficient to describe a lesion as aggressive or non-aggressive on uh, basis of X-ray alone, or do you have to give a differential diagnosis list? Oh, that's a that's a good question. I think that's a very sort of personal preference question. Um, you know, the aggressive, non-aggressive thing, right? Just because we're saying something aggressive doesn't mean it's a tumor, right? Uh, infections often look very aggressive, right? And I noticed when I showed the uh, the young younger patient with the tibia osteosarcoma, a lot of people were thinking infection. I think that's a really fair, um, uh, you know, fair. You know, I would have considered that too. Uh, I think if I was reading that, I would have said that there's something aggressive going on and, you know, consider infection versus, you know, neoplasm, something like that. But uh, Thank you. Yeah. Uh, another question uh, has to do the, uh, between uh, with the difference between, I, I think I'm reading this correctly, paraosteal versus periosteal osteosarcoma. Uh, question is, is there any difference to the assessment? Uh, I don't think there's a difference to the assessment. Are you aware of a difference? I mean, no, no, I'm not under, uh, sure if I understand the question. Maybe it's um, a difference in uh, imaging features is what the question is getting at. Yeah, maybe the location. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the parosteal types are, are extremely rare, and I know it's kind of some, I think it's some boards, uh, you know, they bring it, it comes up in a lot of multiple choice questions, but uh, I don't think you see them very often. There's, you know, there's lots of, there's several different types. Usually we see the conventional type with osteosarcoma. Um, I've seen a few cases of that telangiectetic type osteosarcoma where you get those ABC features, right? It's the big, whenever you see those ABC features, it's just always in the back of your mind. Is this really a osteosarc? And we've, you know, we've had a few cases here where you think it's a giant cell with ABC features and then you biopsy it. Oh, it's a telangiectetic osteosarcoma. And then kind of like when the ER gets a PE study and then every mm, patient yeah. thing now has a PE, I feel like for the next couple of weeks, we think every ABC is uh, osteosarc hiding out. But... Um, yeah, so, it's just, yeah. Uh, so generally the, the paraosteal tend to be posterior femur distal and then the periosteals can be long, um, usually diaphyseal, right? Is that what your experience has been as well? Yeah, yeah. yeah. And then, you know, a lot of these osteochromas, they we recommend doing whole bone imaging, right? To look for mm -hmm. skin nets. Right, right. Um, so, you know, like that tibia case, um, we image the entire tibia with MR to see if there's any skip lesions in there. And then these patients, uh, you know, it varies from, from country to country. And I would say even uh, institution to institution of what you do next, right? Do you do a bone scan and a chest CT? Do you do a PET CT? Do you right, do right. MRI? You know, it's it's... Um, there's but fortunately because they're rare enough, I don't think that there's really great data on this is how you should do it. And I'm sure me saying that's going to get me an email from someone somewhere that's like, well, the best way is how we do yeah. it. Right, right, right. Yeah. And at our institution, if ortho gets them, they get a bone scan. If PD gets them, they get um, a PET. Um, so that's just a variable. But there are NCTN guidelines, I believe. I haven't checked them in a long time. Um, and then final question for small lesions, what is your cutoff for image guided biopsy or when do you ask surgeons to do excisional biopsy? For small lesions? Yeah. Um, you know, I, oh boy. Uh, very rarely do we pump them to surgery here. Uh, we try and we try and at least attempt it. I can think of more recently, there's, there's definitely a little, you know, couple millimeter uh, liposarc recurrence in someone's deltoid muscle. And every time we go to biopsy it, we miss it. Um, so when you speak to the surgeon, they say, I don't care yet. It's so small, right. let it grow. Um, 
so we just keep waiting it keeps growing a little bit every time we we keep going after but i think we've we've i've missed it twice at least um it's so tiny but yeah not really cut off a lot of times you know it's more of a location thing too um you know we sometimes we get asked to biopsy uh, what look like you know nerve sheath tumors in the brachial plexus mm -hmm. and i think that makes a lot of people uncomfortable that you're going to do some iatrogenic nerve injury um but you know when I have a, when it's coming from a surgeon that would deal with those complications, I would just go ahead and do it with their blessing, you know? So I, I wouldn't say there's a cutoff. Do you have a cutoff? It's a flat out. We, no. Doctor? We don't do, we don't do biopsies here. Um, oh. IR does all of them. So, um, and I think they same thing. They, they, they attempt everything, um, within reason. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, and then I, I put a little caveat on that, right? We yeah. get, we get the question a lot. Well, it's not visible on CT. It's only visible on MRI. You won't be able to biopsy it, you know. And a lot of places don't have MRI guided biopsy capability. Um, and in those cases, uh, we use landmarks, and we have sure. really good outcomes of just, hey, we know on MRI it should exist in about this space in the bone, even though you can't see it on CT. You can usually identify and get a successful biopsy that way. All right. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for the for the questions. Uh, um... Thank you again, Dr. Sandro, for the wonderful presentation. Uh, thanks for the audience to the audience for their attention and participation. Our next webinar will be on 2-21-2024 at 7 p.m. Dr. Sarah Kamal will be presenting interesting hip cases. Thank you and good night. Thank you. Have a good night.